Hi everybody, it's been four days since my last video. In that time, um, I've maintained my fast and this morning at 9am I commenced a 24 hour dry fast. Um, as I indicated in my last video, and maybe I talked about it a little bit before, um, but certainly to kick off this second attempt at a complete fast, I mentioned that I was going to incorporate dry fasting into my fast whenever nausea became a problem. And it did today. Uh, it started last night actually. Only sort of on the edge of, of, of bothersome last night, but today it was full-blown. So I took some measures. I um, did an enema, the details of which I won't, um, uh, I won't um, regale you with. Um, suffice to say that I felt better after the enema and a relax. And I feel much better now. This is two hours or three hours after, after the episode I've just described. Um, I just feel lighter because I, I haven't I haven't taken on board any any water. It's very hot. It's about uh, so it's been 32 all day. I think it's dropped down to about 28, 29. Um, as you can see, I'm sitting under my willow tree, river willow here, which is probably going to become my um, favourite little vlog corner. Um, I've got my trusty pins at my feet. My so that he doesn't get into any mischief and uh, yeah I just wanted to uh, I guess touch base and uh, celebrate and rejoice um, in a most unseemly manner that I have conquered the fail point of last fast last attempt the first attempt Namely, the one in which I got to six, or in, actually the start of the seventh day, and then woke up and fried onions and garlic, and uh, what else? Oh, what a concoction! Cabbage, baked beans, anything that was in the cupboard that I could salvage, and I just chucked it all in a pan, and I ate it, and I got a <laughs> predictably sore tummy. But oh my God, what a meal that was. And then later that day, I went to bed with a sore stomach and I woke up at midday and I couldn't get chips out of my mind. If you're an American listening to this, uh, I guess you call them fritters. Fritters from the French, frites, which is simply um, pommes de terre cut into little pieces. We call them chips and they're usually fatter. They're not as big as what you might call wedges. In the, in the British tradition, you know. and I got five dollars worth of them, <laughs> and I got some tomato sauce, two little satchels, and I sat and I ate every one of them, and oh my god, I don't think I've ever enjoyed anything so much in my whole life. Anyway, that's behind us, and uh, today, just very briefly, this is, I'm going to wind this down in about 60 seconds, uh, I just felt so triumphant because I've gotten past that little you know that little notch that tripped me up last time and I'm heading towards the next bus stop which is 14 days two weeks which I think I might have mentioned this before if I achieve will be my lifelong record when I was 20 I got 13 days and I just started reading Paul Bragg and Sheldon and a few other people like that. And I was deeply, deeply, deeply immersed in my Bible and in a mystic called Jacob Berm. And I was wandering around the streets of Melbourne in winter in 1980 with a long coat on. Um, I'd just broken up with my, uh, my girlfriend, soulmate of four years, and I was desolate. But joyful at the same time. Strange mixture. Point of despair, but yeah, I think Jacob Byrne put it like this. Um, the kingdom of heaven only opens its gates when 
when a man reaches, uh, you know, the pits of despair or some some shit like that. I mean, it's been said by others better. And uh, that was certainly true of me at that time. And, yeah, so around that time, I wanted to do some spiritual fasting. Quote, quote, um, I don't believe in any such thing anymore. Except in the sense, if you want to use the word spiritual, to encompass one's interiority. I guess that's that's where spirituality or spirit might still have some um, currency in my worldview. Because it's otherwise, if you if you extract that word completely, which I'm often tempted to do, there are many situations in which you go reaching for a word and you just can't find it. So perhaps it is spirit, but completely divested of any transcendence, you see. That's the important distinction for an atheist and for a, um, a non-transcendentalist, um, such as I is. Um, yeah, so spirituality, interiority, that's probably not a bad equivalent, you know. The best of us, well, actually, why restrict ourselves to the best of us? All that is inside of us. And when I say inside, see, that's also problematic because if you're a monist, as I am, and believe that there are not two substances in the universe, namely mind and matter, but just one, right? I'm a monist. I thoroughly, it's just a ridiculous position to think that there are two things, that there is that somehow mind can be different from a body, from, from matter, and yet can impact on that matter and interact with it. I mean, it's just a crazy theory. It's a wonder that it's had, you know, 400 years currency since, um, since Descartes, but it still does. And it still bothers a lot of very well-paid, very well-heeled philosophers um, uh, who spend time thinking about it and lecturing and writing books about it. Um, I digress big time. I meant to say simply that being a monist, aha, yeah, getting back to, to where I was, um, one's interiority. Yes, using even that expression is problematic because then that has the connotation of an inward world, an, in, an interior world, which is somehow uh, qualitatively different from the material world and of course it's not anything that goes on in my body I might perceive it as interiority but after all it's just more expressions little squishes um, little squirts of brain activity which we call thought uh, this is already getting up to eight minutes. So I was going to try and keep myself to five minutes. So, yeah. Uh, why was I talking about interiority anyway? <laughs> I can't remember. I must have been going to bullshit you all, you know, as the expression goes. If you, if you forget something, my old grandmother used to say, well, it must have been a lie. And I'm sure it wasn't an intentional lie. I'm sure I was trying to say something. Um, yeah... I tell you what, fasting quieten, quietens you, quietens you down. Your mind, I'm sure I've said this before, gains a kind of poise, which is quite incredible. It's like being very vigilant, right? So very alive to everything that's around you but without any anxiety attached to it. And I think it's true to say, it's fair to say that normally when we're vigilant, you know, we associate that with a state of anxiety because the vigilance is hardwired into us for activating all kinds of um, autonomic nervous responses in the body to take care of um, flight or fight um, to prepare us for the shock of pain and injury and all sorts of things like that but to have 
vigilance, to be awake, so awake, and yet calm, utterly calm inside. I think if I had to try and resume the blessings, quote, and quote, of fasting, I think I just did. Anyway, I'll leave you till next time. See you soon. Best.